So hello traders, this is Bookmap and the Trading Dabs project, a series of interviews with successful traders. And today we are having Del the Trader. And welcome Del to our little podcast. Thank you. Uh, you've been trading for many years and basically you're trading uh, stock, is it correct? Yeah, stocks. Stocks. And besides uh, trading stocks, you're doing a series of uh, podcasts on trading, which I find really uh, cool. You know, this uh, sleek design and uh, really interactive um, graphics that explicitly explain uh, traders how to trade and what mistakes to avoid. Could you please tell our audience about your background, especially in design? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm located in Toronto. Um, I've been trading for about, this is my seventh year now in trading. Um, and while that sounds amazing, I spent um, the first few years just fumbling around trying to find my uh, my rhythm, trying to find something that I was interested in within the world of trading. Uh, always uncovering more and more about trading and what that meant for me. Um, I wanted to make a lot of money. <laughs> that's oh. I think that's probably the main reason why a lot of people begin trading. Um, but I found that um, I had I had a problem with motivation. So my I had a job at the time. I had other priorities, and it was very difficult to stick to something and decide that this is going to be a profession that I want to follow for the rest of my life. Um, I, there was something I loved about trading, uh, something inexplicable that I was I was not able to pinpoint for a long time. Um, and so to me, for me personally, the reason why I started my YouTube channel and and uh, all the way until now where we have ActiveTraders.chat, mm-hmm. uh, our trading group, uh, the reason why I did that was to motivate myself to share and to uh, commit myself to learning and growing as a trader and by sharing that with others um, I was I was able to get feedback from people I was able to uh, stay committed uh, to uh, to sharing and growing my craft nice um, you will tell us about active traders a little bit later but I really want to ask you this question that usually we ask in the end of our interviews but what does a trader a word trader mean to you? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Well, that changed for me and what I thought that was um, as I progressed. But um, in my mind, a trader is somebody that can manage risk well um, and that can protect capital. Uh, and and the reason why I say that is because um, you know anybody that goes on and, and buys a stock and sells it uh, isn't a trader that's a speculator mm-hmm. um, when you talk about being a, a day trader a swing trader or an investor uh, the one key factor that travels across all of those fields is that uh, you are a, a risk manager and you grow accounts by respecting the uh, the uh, the capital in that account and protecting it and so uh, for me being a day trader uh, my number one goal is to manage risk, uh, stick to my plan, be an operator um, of my own uh, business plan and trading strategy, um, and then obviously also grow an account. Could you compare yourself or a trader in general to some kind of entrepreneur? You know, when you take uh, your business in your own hands, when you manage all these risks, risks on, on your own, Oh, a hundred percent. It is, you have to have that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you know, uh, being, being a one man army or one woman army is uh, not an easy feat. Uh, and so you need to create this scaffolding around your learning uh, to help prop yourself up and, and bring yourself to new higher levels. Uh, and the only way to do that is with that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, so I, I strongly recommend writing down your, what your goals are um, and trying to meet them every single day. They can be small goals, they can be long-term goals, but really what you're doing is you're trying to grow your own personal business. And um, you know there's no greater reward than getting uh, to one of those goals, sharing that with other people, 
um, helping other people and then seeing all that come back to you tenfold. So definitely need that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh huh. Talking about goals, uh, in the beginning, uh, what you wanted is to make a lot of money. So uh, looking back at all your experience at uh, seven plus years of trading, do you think you have achieved this goal or have your goals changed or are you still pursuing your, your goal? Right. Uh, goals definitely change. Uh, but one goal that doesn't change is making more money. You always want to be making more money as a trader. That's something that you're never, ever, ever going to uh, to change, uh, which is fine uh, because um, I think I think what you do is you add goals on top of each other, you, um, and and you you that sort of becomes your your objective as a trader. So at the beginning, I was really interested in making more money, which made a lot of sense to me at the time. Uh, but then as I went on, I realized that making more money equals more risk and more risk equals. And if you if you don't have that risk in check, it can equal your downfall fairly quickly. Um, so uh, while making money is is definitely a number one goal, a secondary goal that quickly becomes the number one goal is managing risk. OK, so, well, I've talked to some traders and uh, they also mentioned that over time, it, it becomes more like a capi- uh, preserving capital, uh, but not focusing on the money. Of course, we are in this profession to make more money, but then uh, how you do this, you know, how you protect your capital every time you step in in a trade, um, you, learn in, you, you learn this, right? So how was your um, learning path? Uh, did you have any mentor or maybe uh, did you read some kind of influential book that formed your mindset uh yeah i mean uh, through my journey i i when i started trading i started with forex because it was the the one thing that was marketed to me over and over and over again online and there was gurus within that forex space that i thought you know held the secret key to unlocking some kind of a uh, a golden uh trading strategy that would make me a, a billionaire um Quickly, you find out that's not the case, uh, but I didn't have one single mentor. Uh, in fact, I was uh, jumping around from person to person, uh, from uh, educator to educator, uh, trying to find that one person that was going to teach me how to trade. Um, and then what I realized that in that journey, which took me you know, three to four years, um, I, the, the, each one of those gurus had something to offer that was beneficial for me in the long run. And so I took what I thought were the best ideas from each one and I that sort of was ingrained in me um, and I managed to put it together and then try to get rid of all of the other junk that was just detrimental to my own trading. And um, it's funny because, and I think this is one of the more interesting experiences, I thought that the more complex your strategy, the more indicators you had, the more data you had, the better decisions you were going to make in the market. But the exact opposite is true, that once you're able to, um, once you're able to identify what makes a market move, then you start throwing away everything else that is not uh, connected uh, to you making the right decision. And you actually end up with simplicity in the end. It's actually a, a really beautiful, um, uh, packaged, uh, complete, completed, uh, thing at the end. You know, it's, uh, an elegant observation. And, uh, do you think it's connected to some kind of, um, you know, gathering this expertise of becoming more professional and as you level up, uh, you strive to this simplicity and then you could kind of, uh, you know, believe your gut feeling, but it's not like guessing. It's because of your expertise. Do you think it's the case? Yeah, I think a lot of the time it's it's almost like a human nature type of thing where your mind uh, your mind starts um, you know doing away with things that don't really fit with your own personality and your own nature. Uh, so, for example, I wouldn't. I would, I would have, I'm not the kind of trader that's able to um, put huge size on something and then, you know, 
hope that that goes in that direction without any plan. There are traders that do that. And, and you know, there's long-term investors that do that and they'll hold through like incredible dips or that type of thing. I, I'm, I'm not that type of person. And so identifying that um, really helps you to identify what kind of trader you are, which is, I think, the first step in trying to meet your goals. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back at your... Uh, at the start of your trading career, um, do you remember what was the turning point? Was it just that you wanted to finally to make enough money and, and beyond? Or was it some kind of situation that uh, challenged you and then you decided that you have to do something different? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Well, for me, my turning point was, uh, and actually before I tell you what it was, I want to tell you my experience beforehand. Uh, I traded Forex um, and from Forex I went into uh, trading uh, bi- binary options because I thought that it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, that only lasted a couple of weeks but, um, but then I, I discovered options trading and I started learning about options and at the same time I started trading um, uh, futures and I realized that there's there's all these different instruments and all these different this world of of uh, uh, of trading that you can do um, and I was really into technical analysis and I knew that was one of my strengths I, I, I wanted pattern recognition I, I studied advanced patterns like uh, from Gartley all the Fibonacci methods all that type of stuff and really what it came down to in my big aha moment was when I realized that it was more important what's behind a candlestick than what than than the actual candlestick itself and trying to learn about supply and demand and support and resistance uh, to try and inform better entries and exits or to better read a, a price chart uh, led me to going deeper and deeper into what's behind the chart and what's behind the, the chart what you find there is volume and time and sales and the order flow and fully understanding that world allows you to simplify that that macro world there allows you to simplify uh, the world on top of it which is just you know the charts and and everything else that comes with the stocks stock market and trading in general so my aha moment was identifying uh, that I, I needed to fully understand what makes the market move and what's behind the candlestick. And before stocks, you traded gold and crude oil futures, but for how long did you do that? So that's that, that was my big uh, love besides stocks was trading gold and crude oil futures. And being here in Toronto, I traded uh, and having a job at the time, actually for a lot of the time that I traded futures, um, I had to actually be waking up pretty early at five in the morning or so uh, to get ready to trade for seven in the morning um, and then to leave home by 10 in the morning to get to work late. And so that was, uh, that was, that's a pretty big, uh, sacrifice, you know, <laughs> it, it was a yeah, big to sacrifice. change your, to change your lifestyle, to, to adapt to, to, to all these, uh, you know, uh, setups and, uh, well, as we touched upon this theme, could you just briefly explain how your day trading um, day looks like. Yeah, sure. So that was my day for futures. Uh, it was not pleasant. I didn't like waking up early. And uh, it led me to make me very poor decisions sometimes because I was just way too tired. Uh, but now, uh, just being a little bit older, I realize that I do wake up naturally a lot earlier. I think it's because I need to go to the bathroom as soon as I wake up. So there's no, there's no snoozing. Um, and uh, so right now for my day trading, I, I wake up at between 6 and 6.30. Um, I go have breakfast. I, uh, I quickly read the news. Um, and I, I, sometimes I go into and try to do meditation or I'll do uh, uh, some kind of a yoga in the morning. Um, I'll do something that has to do with getting myself centered and balanced. Um, and then I will go to my computer and I'll, I'll be fed, uh, I'll be relaxed. Um, I have had a good night's sleep, which is incredibly important when you're dealing with stress uh, or potential stress. Um, and then I go into a pre-market routine, 
Now, a lot of traders have different pre-market routines. And, and so it's, it's really something that you have to play around with to fit your own uh, trading style and personality. Uh, but for me, I like to have a list of stocks in the morning that I know I'm going to be looking at because of the volume, because of whatever my uh, scanners have told me. Um, and I look at the previous day's action and, and then I, I, I go point by point to try and figure out exactly what I'm looking for, what I want the stock to do. And then I visualize doing that. Um, and so that's going into that 930 open. I know exactly what I want the stock to do. I know all the key points um, and uh, I'm ready to just execute. That's great that you know what to do, <laughs> because yeah. uh, you know uh, you probably know uh, through your active traders uh, chat. Uh, I think that many people uh, who ask you questions, you know, all this, uh, what is going on in chat room, novice traders they just think that okay, I will make this uh, one successful trade and I will make a lot of money. If not this time, another time, and then they continuously fail. Um, what are you talking about in this uh, chat room? How do you share knowledge? And do you find uh, do other people find it beneficial? Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my the objective of the chat room is basically, uh, in a selfish way, it's to um, to duplicate and clone myself into other people and have multiple brains trying to do the same thing. That's the very selfish way of looking at it. <laughs> and the other way is in uh, fostering a, a community uh, that together can make better decisions uh, for the benefit of everyone. And I think that's what people really yearn for is that support and somebody to tell you, yes, you're doing the right thing or no, that's not a good idea um, because it's a scary place jumping into the stock market alone, you feel like there's tons of people out to get you, the stock market's out to get you, and you're going to lose a lot of money. So uh, what I what we do in the chat room is we follow a very specific routine. Uh, part of that routine is the pre-market analysis that we do for members. Um, and then we have, we actually have a language that we use that if you take the course at activetraders.chat, you'll find that there's a, a specific language for identifying uh, setups and uh, being able to grade those setups in terms of quality. And it only takes maybe like half of us, uh, uh, three words. And I know that you're what stock you're looking at, what the pattern is on there, what the quality of that setup is. And then we can continue on with the day and everybody in the chat room um, contributes to that. So it really makes for um, a really, um, uh, I guess, collaborative experience and then the trade management itself is actually less important and more about identifying the opportunities is what we focus on. How many members do you have in your chat room? Not many. Uh, we, we went from having uh, an open chat room that anybody could join uh, from the YouTube link or from Twitter or wherever and we had, you know, we had hundreds of people. The problem is that very, very, like maybe 1% or less actually contributed because a lot of those people were lost. They didn't, they didn't know what, what stocks were or they were experienced traders, but there was no action in the chat room. And I'm not here to create a, um, a uh, the most popular chat room in the world. I'm here to create a special forces group of traders that can um, work on, uh, you know, improving their, their, uh, their life, their lives together. Uh, so we have right now uh, four four people in the chat room, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's and we're not looking to grow at a fast rate either. It's almost like a process. When somebody wants to join, you know, they 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 talk to me. It's and more like that, a community, sometimes right? Sometimes I'll say, exactly. Sometimes I'll say, you know what? Maybe this chat. Actually, the other day I had somebody that messaged me asking me for signals. Well, you know, how good are your are your trading signals? How much money can I make? Can I make back? the investment that I made in the course uh, fast. And, I, and I'm telling them, you know, this is not that type of place. This is where you come to learn uh, about trading and, and uh, how, to, uh, how to become a self-sufficient trader. So um, it 
turning down turning down people is something I do a lot. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it, it has a good per, uh, purpose behind it because if these people get in, they have different and much higher expectations, and then these expectations are just simply not met. Mm, I just wanted to ask, why do you have this language? You, you mentioned you have a specific language to. Um, to show other people that uh, somebody found uh, this or another stock that uh, everybody could trade today. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's uh, another good question. So uh, to our, our members, our members rely on fast, cohesive communication um, and uh, simplicity to alleviate a lot of the stress and, and pain points in trading. So what I did was I put together a video course that's about two hours long and it outlines my personal trading strategy and my, my business plan. And inside of that, we, um, I, I trade three patterns and I trade them over and over and over again in the market and I don't trade anything else. It's a, it's a niche and we trade very specific stocks, uh, these uh, small micro uh, cap stocks um, that are low float that uh, move very fast in the morning um, and usually die off in volume and we have very specific parameters for what we need to see that stock do in order for it to qualify as a trade and so we have on the on the one side three patterns that we call AT1, AT2 and AT3 and these are the active trader patterns and then on the other hand, we have um, a point system for being able to rate uh, all the way from A plus down to C uh, setups, uh, being able to rate those setups. So uh, for example, somebody in the room might say, like today we had PIXY or TNXP. They could say TNXP, AT1, A plus. And that's all they need to say in the room. And I know a wealth of information very quickly because of our trading plan. Incredible and incredibly useful, I guess. Does it prove uh, successful over the course of the day? For example, today, uh, well, again, thank you for joining right after trading as you traded uh, today in the morning. How did it go today in the morning? Oh, today was a great day. Uh, we had uh, a couple winning trades. Uh, we had uh, TNXP and PIXY to winning trades in the room. We didn't have the range on those trades that we would have from other days. I think it's because earnings are coming up and the small cap market isn't doing so well in terms of volatility and volume. Uh, but uh, it's been, it was a, a good trading day. We identified our setups, even if they weren't winning trades, if we identified our setups correctly and we followed our plan and if they lost money, it's still a good trading day. Um, and and it's, it's because you need to separate yourself from the outcome of the trade and focus more on the process. And so one of the, one of the main indicators that you're on the right path is in the way you collect data on your, on your trading strategy. So for us, we, uh, we have, we have, we, we love Excel sheets and Google sheets. And so we keep a diary, um, of our setups and how they performed in the market and how we performed what our level of confidence was in the trade, um, what the, the quality of the execution was. And we keep that as a separate log aside from our P&L and how much money we made because <clears throat> it's much more important to identify um, your the quality of your selection and how well you're identify, identifying the, the patterns um, than trying to focus on the fact that you made, you know, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000 in a day. Or lost that much, uh, and so growing the level of confidence in your own trading setups is the number one thing that we focus on. And the, the only way to do that is to what we like to call becoming an operator, becoming an operator of your own strategy, and focusing on the, uh, the right things. Mm -hmm. And also, you mentioned that uh, you have some kind of scanners that help you to identify. Um, you know, the trading stocks for the day. Uh, what are these scanners? And uh, could you describe, uh, you know, to our audience 
what you can do with them, you know, what indicators they show. Yeah, sure. Uh, so if you're trading stocks, uh, I think the number one problem is that there are thousands on thousands of stocks that you could trade. So the number one thing to do is very quickly start boiling down to a few stocks. I only look at three to four stocks at once when it comes to the 930 open and I'm only making one or two trades a day. So I've boiling down from thousands of stocks down to a couple is very, very difficult if you don't set and know exactly what you're looking for in the market. So I use uh, uh, Trade Ideas. It's a, a software that lets you scan and set parameters uh, for what comes up on your scans. Um, and it's something that I've, um, over the years, really boiled down into exactly what I need to see. So for me, if it's not on my scanner, I am not trading it. And that's that really saves you from a lot of pain when it comes to over trading um, or trading outside of your rules. And because we have such specific parameters that we need to see, we have, we have, we have parameters for the pre-market, for the market open, for the afternoon session, um, and uh, those parameters change um, as the day progresses. Uh, and so our list can grow if you don't change that. Uh, but as, as the day progresses, you need to really start continuing boiling down your stocks if you're going to uh, be trading. So, um, yeah, so Trade Ideas is, is what I use for scanners. Uh, but we have other people in the room that use uh, the Thinkorswim scanner um, or the um, uh, Trading View uh, stocks screener. Um, all of those, I give examples for how to set up your parameters so that we are all looking at the same thing. Okay, nice. Uh, it's good to know to to our audience because again, there are there is so much software available, especially when it is being marketed at uh, people because simply because they like trading, you know, and then they go to Facebook or just Google something, and then these ads pop up everywhere, and people just uh, people who don't have enough experience, they just don't know what to choose. Yeah. Because all these uh, things are well marketed. But uh, here you are, you are ready to trade, you, you know what uh, kind of, what stocks you are going to trade, uh, you have all this information available uh, previously. Um, what is your next move? Sure, I can highlight some of the, the important parameters that we need um, or important things that we need the stock to do. Uh, so for our style of trading, we are in and out within, I think my, my average hold time is about um, an hour and a half for winning trades. So I'm there to be for, uh, I'm not scalping. Um, I mean, I guess there's different def definitions for it. Uh, but what I look for and what we look for in the room is for those big momentum plays. So a lot of the time, I think 99% of the time right now, we are shorting stocks. So I'm technically a short seller at the moment. But last year, I was longing stocks 90% of the time. And I think it just has to do with the, uh, the, how the market is reacting. But the, the one thing that we look for is volume. So volume is the lifeblood of, of momentum traders. It's the number one thing that we need to see. Um, it's what, uh, from a fundamental and from a technical perspective, we need in order to make the right decision. Um, it's almost like what lifts the veil uh, from the confusion that you might have about where market sentiment is. Um, it allows us to compare it uh, against other movers, against other stocks, uh, even stocks that ran in previous uh, years or previous weeks. Um, and it allows us to make that decision in, 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 and, uh, and gives us the focus uh, to analyze a stock with confidence. So volume is number one. And then another super key factor is the range of a move. So you don't want to be trading. If a stock bounces between a $1 move, let's say $1 and $2 all the time. And, you know, one day it pops up uh, with high volume, but it only goes to $2. I'm not really interested in it. I want to see this stock, you know, 10 times its range at least. I want to see this thing really fly. 
uh, because that's when people get the most emotional. And really what you're doing when you're trading these low float um, stocks, these are very small companies. Some of them are, you know, don't do so well. And you're tr looking to trade them back down to zero is you want people to get emotionally invested in the opposite direction so that you can take advantage. Uh, and that's that's what trading this type of niche is about. Uh so is this related somehow to the over-the-counter? Are these the, the type of companies you're, you're trading? Right. So there's OTC stocks is what you're referring to. Uh, what we trade is our NASDAQ stocks. Uh, so we trade NASDAQ stocks that are over a dollar and uh, usually under $10. Um, and then the, the market cap that we look for is usually under $2 billion dollars. Um, and we have all these other parameters, but they're, they're stocks that are, a lot of the time there's pharmaceuticals that are in this area that, um, you know, they, they've been maybe stock split like, you know, 10 or 20 times in the past. Um, and they're, they're simply used as a vehicle for value delivery for their uh, shareholders. Um, it's a definitely a longer conversation, but if you imagine it like you're trying to tame a, a wild Uh, or, or a group of wild horses. Um, and then there's that one horse that keeps doing the same thing over and over again. You know, it keeps kicking you off that horse. Um, instead of trying to move off to another horse or another group of stocks, you want to stay on that one horse. You want to really find out what makes that horse tick. What's that per What's the horse personality of that horse? Uh, you know, what, uh, what, kind of food, what kind of food does it like? I don't know. Do horses eat different kinds of food? I don't know. That's an interesting, you know, comparison. Yeah. But I want to be, I want to be the master of one horse. I don't want to try and tame all the wild horses in the world. In fact, I don't care. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, oh my God, Tesla's doing this or Netflix is doing that, or you'll see all sorts of stuff in the news. Um, I don't, I don't care. Uh, what I care about is taking a, a percentage chunk and dropping it into my account every day and that's my job because I'm a risk manager uh, so I don't I don't I don't I don't go outside of that zone yeah that's real strong you know uh, this is what a lot of traders <clears throat> need to learn because uh, you know I'm not trading and uh, honestly uh, I am the one who would follow news who would uh, look into Tesla and like being amazed by, by that but I envision myself as an investor You know, I would rather invest in something that I understand and maybe it will not do well in, in this year, another year, but eventually in the future it, it might do good. Do you uh, personally invest besides trading? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm an early crypto investor. Uh, so I, I saw that one coming uh, from 2013. Um, and what else? Um, I do some... Uh, long-term investing with savings accounts uh, or are what we have in Canada tax-free savings accounts and our RRSPs um, and uh, yeah so I, I do do some longer term investing uh, it's I've, I've chosen um, a firm that I believe um, is sound and that can manage my money um, and I do that because I want to focus on day trading That's, that's where I want my focus to be 100% of the time. But I will have some investments in, uh, or swing trades, some longer-term swing trades on companies that I believe um, have a future. I will dabble in those with some of my savings accounts, yeah. That's great. That's great. Not only risk management, but financial management. It's really important. How does trading affect your everyday thinking? Do you find yourself uh, being over-rational or... Uh, making decisions, uh, you know, as lightning, like really fast. Yes, psychologically, trading is one of the toughest things you will ever have to do in your life. Um, it's a true test. It's almost like being a Jedi and looking into uh, into that that glass mirror from that last movie. Uh, anyway, I don't know if you get the reference, but the the idea is you have to really look within yourself uh, to understand where your strengths are psychologically and where your faults are. So for me personally, um, I always had a, a really hard time with overtrading. Overtrading was my thing. I would jump in and out of trades. I would rack up commissions. 
um, and I would have I would suffer some serious losses in the past. And my focus on stopping to overtrade was by giving myself rules, you know, giving myself a box um, and staying within that box. And I needed that personally. Um, and that's just something that's catered to my own needs. And the people that join our trading room, I think, are also in, in search of that. Uh, so psychologically, you need to prepare yourself um, emotionally, um, control your emotions. I don't believe that you should be removing your emotions completely. Um, and I, I have a strong, strong uh, belief in uh, the uh, gut feeling that a trader develops over the years as well. Do you, uh, what is your philosophical background and do you see that it kind of reflects uh, your profession as well? I know it's not an easy one. Yeah, that's a <laughs> great topic. No, that's a great topic. Uh, you, so my wife always tells me that um, this is the perfect job for me. Um, and it's because I, I've, I've always, I come from a, a family that's very political and I've always been into politics and um, I, I was always obsessed with reading about finance and under, really understanding how the world works. And so um, when I found out about the truth about money and how economies work and the truth about who's, who's in, in power when it comes to finances in the world, uh, it makes it very difficult to go and live that nine to five job. Uh, so I think my personally, I need to be in control of my own life. I hate the idea of having to ask somebody to go on a vacation. That just kills me. I just can't do that. Um, and I think the, the that that's uh, philosophically, that's what translates for me is being in control of my own destiny. Uh, if I want to fail, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to rely on somebody for my future and the future of my family's financial uh, health. That's not going to happen to me. So if if um, if if we end up on the streets, it's because <laughs> of me. And uh, I'm sure my wife would appreciate that. It's really important. Uh, the family support, uh, I think it's crucial. And a lot of traders would agree with me. And, you know, especially those who are like uh, above uh, 40 years old, uh, the ones we I talk to, family support, uh, this understanding, uh, this uh, trading is profession. It's not a hobby. It's not gambling. It's true profession. Um, well, uh Thank you for answering this uh, really hard question, but I see I see uh, several answers uh, to that, and the one is probably you haven't answered before, and I was asking previously about this turning point, uh, what made you a trader, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, it is the feeling of freedom that. Uh, you are responsible for your life, <clears throat> you are responsible for what you earn for your family, and when you go <clears throat> to a vacation. So am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. That's that's the number one thing for me is that sense of uh, in individuality and um, independence. I see, I see. Well, um, you probably could tell us a little bit about your trading style. You briefly mentioned it, but maybe there are some, uh, you know, not tips, but something specific about your own style. And I think it's it's really interesting when you compare different traders because always there is something that um, gets you and you want to borrow it, you know, still like an artist, something like that. Yeah, sure. So my trading style relies heavily on technical analysis. I'm a technical trader by craft. Um, and then my conviction on the trade is strengthened by the fundamentals. Uh, so we not only look at the technicals, but then once we're ready to use those technicals in a live market situation, uh, we have the confidence in the trade due to the fact that we know that the stock uh, needs to come down or it has so in the past or the fundamentals tells us that uh, this is uh, the right direction to be trading the stock in. Uh, it just helps to strengthen that uh, technical bond. So... Um, I have an understanding, we have an understanding of how the market moves, how a stock moves on a chart. 
uh, and we look for and find areas of conflict on that chart. Uh, so my edge uh, in the strategy is really built around a few core elements, um, volume analysis, order flow analysis, and market auction theory, which is our spin on auction market theory. Um, it really comes together to define areas of fair and unfair value on a historical price chart. And it really gives us that ability to pinpoint when price will expand out of consolidation with uh, a high degree of accuracy. So just like I explained in my video on YouTube uh, for day trading strategies for beginners, um, that there's two ways to chop up a chart uh, exp expansion and consolidation and these are the two uh, things that happen over and over and over again on a price chart uh, so that is sort of like the, the quick walkthrough of what our strategy entails um, but really behind the scenes and what allows this to be successful is our position sizing and our risk management so positioning yourself for low risk high reward situations where we've back tested our AT1, AT2, and AT3 strategies over and over and over again. We know there's a statistical edge down to the percentage point. And so we just need to be an operator and let the statistical edge do the work for us. And that, I think, uh, that, that sort of box that we've created lets, really lets us concentrate on the right things and not worry too much about the outcome because we know out of a thousand trades, we're going to be uh, taking money out of the market, and that's what it count. That's what counts when you're trying to be a trader with any type of longevity in the market. Mm -hmm. Well, and definitely, as you already mentioned several times, trading is um, a lot of stress, and sleep is number one. Um, you know, point that could help you deal with the stress. But could you please tell our audience? How, what are the other things that could help release this stress, especially after you finish trading? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a great one. I think probably the number one thing to do is disconnect. So go do something outside, go spend time with your family, uh, go play a board game, something to get yourself off of the computer for me is super important. Uh, or else I find that I'm tired when I come back to do research at the end of the night or um, in the morning if I've spent too much time on the computer beforehand, um, I will I'll almost get like a deer in the headlights and not be able to concentrate. Uh, so from a, from a disconnecting standpoint, um, it's super important to center yourself. Uh, and just from a general life perspective, I mean, we, we trade because uh, we want to have an easier life. And if it's work, to you to sit in front of a computer and you're trading all day long, uh, you're not making a very good hourly rate. So give yourself um, a break and, you know, spend, you're a trader, you have, you're in charge of your own destiny, you know, go out and do whatever you want. Just don't trade all day long. It's, uh, it's inhumane to yourself. I see. Well, thanks uh, for answering this one. I think it was uh, an unexpected one, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, and as I'm, as I'm tr talking to traders, I'm also learning a lot. As I already said, I'm not a trader, but um, I also see this connection with, with you guys because in, in my opinion, you, you do a, a big job, you know, you uh, keep this... Uh, financial uh, markets moving and therefore you're moving all the companies that uh, make this world world uh, work right but sometimes people think that traders don't bring don't bring any value to society um, have you any have you heard about this one and how do you feel about that uh, yeah I've, I don't think I've ever given that any real thought. Uh, part of me never really cares what anyone else thinks, um, but um, if if I were challenged, I would I would say uh, that um, you know it's it's like a, a the, when when a business grows, it needs to be successful inside of a, a larger market, and uh, this market is a group of buyers and sellers, and so if you have a business that sells shoes, let's say. 
and you're very successful and now you want to turn this into something that's going to create wealth for your family for multiple generations. What you're going to do is you're going to go public with this company or you're going to sell it to some private investors. Uh, the, the idea is that you're going to bring in more people to help prop this up for the future. And, and so traders play a, a key role in that puzzle of creating valuable wealth for the future, uh, both from an individual standpoint, but also all the way up to a corporate standpoint where, um, you know, shares are sort of like the ownership over a company. And we are the ones that are going to be valuing or, or judging the value of those shares based on the information that we're given. And that allows for, um, I think, uh, a res respectable market. And I'm not saying that the market is fair. I'm saying that it's respectable. The decisions uh, on a stock going up or down are, are, uh, are uh, respected because of the, the number of participants. So it's almost like um, when you want to uh, really know whether a company is uh, worth or the, the value of that company, where that value of the company is, uh, you're going to take a look at the stock price uh, and the traders will say whether this is too high or too low and uh, you know, long term and day traders and swing traders will all have differing opinions and the truth will come out eventually. <clears throat> a nice one. Thank you. Well, just a couple of questions to wrap up this interesting conversation. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you, Dell. Um, do you think that a trader needs some formal education? I mean, they're going to need to be able to read. That's uh, a number one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. Um, you know, it's... In, in the age of the internet, I think um, people can get far, far ahead than any type of curriculum that can be made. So I, I mean, my previous job was in tech and we looked for people that had the willingness to learn and the drive and passion to learn beyond and go and, and find the answers themselves and learn beyond what the, the textbook says. And uh, that's where you find true innovation is when you find people that are willing to think quote unquote outside the box and that is also what can make for a really great trader is somebody that's willing to innovate and gather the ideas uh, despite these things not being taught to them in a uh, organized fashion um, so uh, it takes somebody that's dis discerning i see i see and uh, before you started trading did you have any kind of illusions about what trading is Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had I had no idea the the amount of research and the amount of hours that I would have to spend in order to to get anywhere near mastering something like this. I mean, I'm I'm still nowhere near that. Uh but um the the amount of work that it takes is something that people should be uh willing to accept that you are going to not understand many many things. Um, and I think, uh, for example, I think, I think one of the greatest examples is, uh, level two tape reading. Uh, now people will, or traders will say, oh, it's, I'm seeing this on the level two. I'm saying that on the level two, it takes years of staring at these moving numbers on, a, on, on the screen in order to identify patterns and be able to make judgments based on flashing numbers and how many buyers and sellers there are in a market. Now, that type of thing has been expanded by you guys at Bookmap. And that's why I'm such a huge fan of Bookmap is because now I don't need to just be able to, you know, calculate or remember all these numbers and what price they were at by staring at a level two to identify the fact that there's a big hidden order somewhere or that there's an institutional coming in dumping orders on the bid mm -hmm. um, I can I can just look at the book map and I can see the history of that visually and that is a key innovation so that for example that that type of stuff is changing every day and it's becoming easier to identify um, these types of of moves in the market because of the innovation however fully understanding how to utilize that technology is a learning curve in itself. So I would, uh, I would, I would still be highly cautious. And, I, and to my own traders, 
uh, in the room while we use Bookmap. Um, and just to highlight what we use every day, I use Bookmap, uh, for obviously for the order flow analysis. Um, I use Bookmap, and then I use Trading View for charting, and then I have my broker platforms for execution. And I tell my traders uh, that having too much information thrown at you right away is detrimental to your uh, learning curve. So what they need to do is focus on really fully understanding and taking in the patterns, being able to recognize those patterns or working on the pattern recognition is what we like to call it. And then once you are so confident in the chart, you know exactly what to, what to look for. Uh, I have uh, a quote that I put out on, out on, on Twitter uh, where uh, I basically say that technical analysis, the objective is not to predict future price movements, but it's to um, be able to um, identify areas of conflict on a chart. That's the real value in technical analysis. And so adapting that to stock trading, you want to focus on the pattern recognition because it tells you what areas on the chart based on the history and based on what we like to use in market auction theory, uh, the volume analysis. Um, based on all of our analysis, we're going to say, okay, this price point here is going to be challenged by buyers and sellers at one point because it was challenged in the past and because of X, Y, and Z in our technical analysis. Then I want to jump over to book map and I want to wait for price to get, as soon as price gets to that level, I want to be looking at my book map because I want to see that battle unfold in front of me between buyers and sellers. And that right there is an incredible edge. So I'd say to anybody using book map right now, um, don't just make decisions based off of the fact that you saw like some big sellers or big buyers come in. Use technical analysis to pinpoint areas on the chart where you're going to be paying 100% attention uh, to. Yep. Okay. So the final question I have for you, uh, Delta Trader, um, if you had an opportunity to sit down with a prominent trader of the past or today, who that trader would be and would you... What would you ask him about? Yeah, so right now I think I'm most fascinated by uh, Peter Brandt. Um, and if you uh, are a subscriber to Real Vision, uh, and if you've heard of Real Vision, uh, they 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 um, they put ideas together, uh, trading ideas. They have interviews. They have all sorts of video content for traders and fi uh, people in finance. Uh, but Peter Brandt uh, is this a 40-year veteran of trading in the stock market. Uh, and actually, he trades everything, not just the stock market. And I, I've seen on his Twitter that he's also been trading, uh, you know, um, crypto even. Um, and he has this really, really simplified way of, um, of identifying patterns and, and trading the pattern and sticking to that specific rule. And I think that is so rare uh, to have that level of longevity, I mean, 40 years of trading with the same strategy, he's got such a wealth of information. Um, he also has a book. You can uh, go take a look at it. Um, you can just search him, Peter Brandt. Um, that's, I think it's such, a, such an incredible uh, wealth of information based on 40 years of trading. Uh, very few patterns that I think I re resonates most with me. So I would love uh, to interview him and pick his brain. Well, and we had the pleasure to interview you, Delta Trader. It was indeed a very interesting hour, and we hope that our audience also liked it. And if they liked it, they should comment and share, and we welcome all kinds of uh, questions as well. And you, the audience, should also follow Delta Trader on Twitter and go to activetraders.chat for more ideas on what stocks to trade and if you have any any questions again you can ask Dell the trader thank you Dell for this conversation thank you so much for the interview I, I had a blast and um, uh, thank you for having me on and and uh, I, I would definitely recommend anybody that is into order flow analysis or stock trading or volume analysis to take a look at bookmap uh, it's definitely changed the way I, I trade and helped my craft in so many ways.
But at the beginning, everybody should gather some knowledge. And thank you for listening to us and picking up some knowledge, especially from uh, professional traders we interview, like Delta Trader. So bye-bye. See you next time.